All right, thank you. Um, let me just note that after um, Professor Abbott is finished speaking, if there are questions, we're going to ask you to come up here to the microphone. We are recording this lecture uh, for you know, the benefit of posterity. And so we would ask if you have a question to do it at the microphone so that that will be, uh, the, your question will be heard as well as uh, Professor Abbott's response. Um, now, Ben Abbott got interested in science and nature from watching TV and mountain biking in the foothills of Mount Timpanogos. And it's interesting, one of these sort of interesting things that happened, he, he wrote that near the end of his senior year at Orem High, he slipped on a pamphlet for the Quinney Scholarship at Utah State University, uh, and he ended up applying for it and uh, deciding to study watershed and earth systems uh, at Utah State. During uh, his work for that bachelor's degree, he worked as an undergraduate researcher in northern Alaska, investigating how fish influence nutrient cycles in Arctic lakes. And this led to his PhD at the University of Alaska Fairbank, Fairbanks. Um, after finishing his PhD in 2014, he worked as a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the French National Science Foundation in Rennes in France. And while in Western France, he investigated the resilience of agricultural catchments and coastal ecosystems uh, to nutrient loading and disturbance from agriculture and urbanization. Um, he now works primarily on uh, a lot of things, permafrost climate feedback and water quality in river networks. And he does this through an interdisciplinary uh, perspective, drawing on biogeochemistry, evolutionary biology, and social science. Um, he's particularly interested in social and environmental sustainability, science communication, and exploring the Mormon doctrinal and cultural basis for ecological stewardship. Um, he's been married for 10 years and has four children, who he says take after him in their love of animals, television, and biking. Uh, <laughs> so that's great. Please uh, join with me in welcoming uh, Ben today. Well, thank you for that generous uh, introduction, and thank you for coming. I'm really excited to talk to you today. I wanted to recognize before I get started, uh, both of my parents are here, Susan and Scott Abbott, and uh, thank you for birthing me and conceiving me. <laughs> and then my wife is also here with our youngest daughter, uh, Naomi. So thank you, Rachel, for your support. I also wanted to recognize uh, this work has been made possible by support from several federal sources, the National Science Foundation, also state sources, the Division of Natural Resources, and then a few uh, local groups as well, the Sant Foundation and the Provo River Watershed Council. Um, we sometimes get snooty, and I've been guilty of this in the past, about where uh, funding comes from. But what I've learned is we need to be acting on all levels from the individual level up to the international level. So we should be addressing all these problems with whatever resources we can uh, pull together. Does anybody know what this picture is? Evaporation ponds near the Great Salt Lake. Um, a few months ago, landing in an airplane, just took this picture out of the window. And I thought it was interesting the way the evaporation ponds work are you draw in, the, so the Great Salt Lake is just below um, off frame. You draw the water in, to these um, ponds, and then as you follow along, they get more and more concentrated in salt as the water uh, goes through there. More of the water's evaporated, so the salinity increases. That's, a, that's governed by physics. So as the water moves up, the salinity increases gradually. But what's going on with the color? Because the color doesn't change gradually. You go from this green, and it can be whatever color, then all of a sudden it's brown. Then you'd get in these psychedelic purple and uh, pink colors. That's the biological response to the change in the physical environment, which doesn't have a gradual or linear response to it. When the conditions are right, all of a sudden a completely new community of archaea and bacteria can survive in that environment. 
And here, usually you can't see that, but here you can see it really distinctly. And that's one of the points I want to come back to throughout this lecture, is that in nature, linear and gradual responses are the exception, not the norm. But before getting into that, I uh, thought we'd take a little trip in time, since this is BYU. Let's go back 3,500 years. And our epic now is called the uh, Anthropocene, or Anthropocene. That's actually my preferred pronunciation, but it's probably wrong. I come from the natural sciences. Um, I think this is the most unlikely epic in lots of ways. Here's an experience that Moses had when he was caught up in a vision. And the Lord says, Behold, this one thing I show unto thee, Moses, my son, for thou art in the world, and now I show it unto thee. And it came to pass that Moses looked and beheld the world upon which he was created. And Moses beheld the world and the ends thereof, and all the children of men which are and which were created. Of the same he greatly marveled and wondered. So when I first read that, I really thought, Oh, yes, this is reinforcing this idea of human domination of the earth, right? He looked at the expanse of humans and marveled. But what was his reflection after that experience? I'm sure some of you know. He said, now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. So he actually saw when, he, when the creation was revealed to him the smallness of humankind. And if you go to the census website of the U.S. government, an interesting option that they have is you can go back in time. You can go back in time long before they started collecting census numbers. You can look at estimated human population 10,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. So it's based on a, a variety of assumptions, but they're uh, pretty sure. Around this time, there were maybe 7 million people on Earth, throughout the whole Earth. That means there were less individual humans than there are species on Earth. And if I was going to pick a winner among those 8 million species, maybe 8.7 million, humans would not have been high on my list. Slow, no claws or teeth to speak of, extremely rare on the landscape. They only existed kind of where the conditions were perfect. But there was a pretty extraordinary prophecy that had been made actually prior to this, uh, to this vision right at the very beginning of Genesis, where God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So Again, we sometimes, and actually I've been criticized as uh, a Christian sometimes in scientific circles of being too focused on humans, um, right? Our whole religion is based off of this anthropomorphized God. But this is a pretty unlikely prophecy that has actually come to fruition. And let me try to convince you of that. Here are some observations that have been made. These aren't model projections of what's going to happen in the future. This is a... Uh, a dashboard, what's going on in the Earth system right now. Humans have plowed, paved, dredged, burned, or built over three quarters of the Earth's land surface and about four fifths of the continental shelves of the ocean. That's the direct human footprint. Uh, we subtract out the areas that are covered in ice. But humans have directly modified the majority of the Earth's surface. If you add up the weight of all humans, we call that the anthropomass. And then maybe add on our livestock as well, because our livestock outweigh us by more than a factor of two. For every pound of human flesh, there are two and a half pounds of chicken, uh, beef, uh, goats, the things that are domestic animals. If you add all of those together, we constitute about 98% of all terrestrial vertebrates just our combined weight. So one species and the species that we control now represent 98% of the animal. Now, there are way more plants and way more microbes. Those of us in ecology know there have to be the primary producers to support that biomass. But for me, this puts into perspective what a small shift in our behavior might have on that remaining 2%. If we're small, 
what we do doesn't matter as much. But now that we're big, our actions matter acutely for the Earth system. Uh, this one blows my mind every time I look at it. Our activities, agriculture, construction, uh, we're moving a lot of sediment around. It is at least 10 times and maybe up to 100 times more than all natural processes on Earth. All of the glaciers, all of the rivers, uh, all of the landslides on the land and under the sea, even tectonic drift, we have outstripped these natural processes. We truly are living in the, the time of humans. Our use of fossil fuels and fertilizers have famously in augmented the carbon cycle by 10%. That's what's causing uh, climate change. But if you look at other biogeochemical cycles, which are planetary in scale, the nitrogen cycle, we've more than doubled. The phosphorus cycle, four, five, maybe six times, about 500% increase. Just human activity. Again, one of eight to nine million species is doing this. And those things added together have increased the rate of extinction of other species by about three orders of magnitude, a thousand times uh, bef the, the background rate that species were being uh, replenished and, and new species were emerging. So that means every year, two to 10,000 species are going extinct. Now, I think that that should cause us to reflect for two reasons. One is that's a lot of species. Two is it's a pretty big range. We don't have a good grip of what our whole footprint is doing to the Earth system. And then finally, this is the one that actually changed my whole, uh, after slipping on that um, application for a scholarship and knowing I liked science, this over the past few years has really changed the way that I view the importance of these issues. The pollution that we create kills approximately 5 million people every year. That's 41,000 people every day are dying from the negative products that we're putting into the environment. That's primarily air pollution, but we'll talk about that more later. If you're like me, 15 million doesn't mean anything. Um, it's too big to understand, so I'll compare that later on to other sources of death. Um, let's move forward. So we're not with Moses anymore. This is uh, around 400 BC. Anybody have a guess who said this? Socrates. Socrates, oh, very nice. I, d I told this to an intro-level class one time, and uh, one of the students said, is that Jesus? And <laughs> no, it's not, it's not Jesus, it's Socrates, who was complaining about the young people, millennials. <laughs> so when we see this kind of pattern, we can start to think, this, uh, chicken, it's a chicken little phenomenon, right? The sky is always falling, but is anything actually changing? Um, and in fact, a uh, while later, a couple millennia later, uh, Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr said, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. It's changing, but it's always changed. And that's one of the most common questions that I get about climate change, about any of these environmental issues. Now wait, things have changed in the past. It's no different now. But I'm kind of haunted by Jorge Luis Borg, who said, centuries of centuries and only in the present do things happen. I think it's really reckless for us to say, just because we've always been complaining about change in the past means that it couldn't be different now. Now, from any of these perspectives, we can't figure out what's going on. But if we look at some data, I think we, we might be able to. So we have this whole constellation of things changing in the Earth system. And today, I just want to ask three questions. What are the most pressing environmental problems? Each one of these individual issues is hard to understand on its own, and it's even more difficult to have the perspective to prioritize them, to figure out, is it more important that I remove BPA from my water bottle or drive my car less, right? We're hearing messages all of the time, and it's hard to put them in uh, context. What is the cause of these problems? And then finally, what, if anything, can we do about it? Hence my title, uh, How Close Are We to the Edge? And uh, one of my friends, uh, a true environmentalist, asked me on social media, great title, but we all know that we're way past the edge, right? There's nothing that we can do. So I hope to ask these questions today. I don't have all of the answers, um, and so maybe you'll have some challenges for me. I'm using an ecosystem approach. Now, ecosystem comes from the Greek word uh, oikos. Anybody recognize 
great kind of yogurt, right? So oikos means home, so homemade yogurt. Ecosystem, because it's taking the physical structure of the house and including the biological things that live inside. So it's the interaction between the non-living and living parts of the ecosystem. And the textbook that, uh, until this semester, I made my students buy for $110. This is the uh, figure from that. Thank you, Pearson. There are these different spheres that are all interacting here. And I think this is beautiful and great. But do you see anything that's missing? Us. <laughs> Front row, attentive. Uh, we, ca we call it the anthroposphere sometimes, but it really is nestled here within the biosphere plus the parts of the lithosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere that we've modified. So we actually extend out through all of these different spheres. And I think it's a huge problem, one of the most important problems, that we continue to teach ecology, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, water cycle, any of these subjects without it being integrated with humans. So that was the first uh, lecture of Ecology 101. Here's lecture two, ecological laws. We sometimes are criticized as ecologists for not having any laws. In physics and chemistry, you have tidy equations that are always true until you figure out a few tens of years later that they're not true, right? Um, but there actually are four ecological laws, but because this is a systems science that is inv uh, it's involving emergent properties across multiple levels, they're not equations. They're pretty different. Here's uh, Barry Commoner's phrasing of these four laws from the 70s. The first law, everything is connected to everything else. Maybe sounds inane and even dumb. Number two, everything must go somewhere. Number three, the most enigmatic and hard to understand, nature knows best. That's sometimes described as the law of unintended consequences. So we look at a system, we think, I could optimize that. I could improve that. You know what would be great is if the water wasn't so variable in that river. But there almost are always unintended consequences that ripple through the system. There was a reason for that the way that it was. And then the fourth one that's been adopted uh, in economics and science fiction, that's where I uh, read it first, Robert Heinlein, uh, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch or Tanstaffel. So two of these are involving conservation of mass. Right? So you might be more familiar with that physical law. Um, this one is, in my opinion, uh, the most critical and really stems from the combination of all of them. So with these four laws, we can start to tease apart what's going on in the Earth system. Law one... Who can remember what's law one? Thank you. Everything's connected to everything else means that these systems don't typically react in a linear fashion. So this is a, a figure from a famous science paper from a few years back. And if we're thinking about human land use, let's say this is 100%, this is 0% for an ecosystem. As our land use increases, uh, the response variable here, we could think the number of sage grouse. So it's currently uh, on the endangered species list right here in Utah. Initially, you don't see any response in the number of sage grouse. So you might conclude, no problem. There's no link between human land use and sage grouse. You keep on pushing, though, and all of a sudden, you haven't just affected the sage grouse, you've affected some of their prey, what they eat. You've affected some of their habitat. Maybe you didn't know that they nested in a different place that they spent the rest of the year. And you have a nonlinear or threshold response. Now, this paper says we have to put boundaries on these big dimensions upstream of where that threshold is. The problem, of course, is uh, it's not advertised on the label where those thresholds are. It's different. There's a huge amount of complexity on the human side and on the, the natural side. You also might have a response like this. We see this a lot in the natural system. You do actually have uh, a decrease, but then the rate of change uh, accelerates as you move through. So this, again, is the norm, not the exception. This is how uh, ecosystems respond to human perturbation. Uh, here's a real-world example from 1992. Some of us were alive that far back. Um, the, this is the uh, tons of Atlantic cod that were collected, harvested off the coast of uh, Newfoundland. This was a multi-billion dollar industry. And uh, it was growing through time. 
as the number of fisher people grew and the technologies improved, something really changed right after World War II, where all of a sudden, uh, fishers had heavy, powerful motors and uh, sonar. So they could identify where the fish were, and instead of just collecting the fish near the surface, they could dredge the bottom. They got a lot more fish. And so you see this explosion in the amount of cod that were caught. And then there was a threshold there that they didn't know about. Actually, there were warnings. And for about five years before, uh, they were recommended to leave large areas of the cod fishery not fished. But it was determined that there wasn't enough scientific certainty to do anything about it. So it would be too economically costly to reduce the number of fish that were harvested because about 50,000 people directly depended on that industry. Well, the happy days ended. There was a huge crash, but then things recovered. It seemed like it was maybe just a bad year. And then in 1992, the fishery collapsed. 99% decrease in the, in the catch. But it was fine because it was only going to last for two years. That's how long it takes the cod to go through their life cycle. So this is a global picture. It wasn't just happening in Newfoundland. It goes a little bit farther in time. You can see right around the same time period, this collapse in cod. And still to this day, it's at 3 or 4% of what the cod fishery was before. An irreversible, at least on human time scales, collapse of that ecosystem because we went over a threshold we didn't know about. Now, uh, what we think happens is the caplin, the prey species of that cod, its nesting area got destroyed by the dredging of, uh, so even after you weren't collecting the cod anymore, the food wasn't there for them. They couldn't recover. Adding laws two and four, anybody have an excellent memory can remind us what are laws two and four? Tanstaffel, law four. Everything must go somewhere. Oh, you guys are sharp. Um, so now we can start to think about linkages between Earth systems. And we call these ecosystem feedbacks. It's a natural response to human uh, disturbance. It can amplify the change, it can make it go faster, it can stabilize the change, or it can become the driving uh, force behind the change. We call that a tipping element. It no longer depends on the input from humans, it's a runaway train. It's either going faster or slower on its own. And uh, here is actually from the 2017 uh, National Climate Assessment uh, published by the Trump administration, an identification of some tipping points in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this is specifically looking at climate tipping points, how you can have loss of Arctic sea ice, an accelerating feedback, um, permafrost carbon and methane hydrates, uh, one of the things that I study. Some people have hypothesized that could be uh, a runaway train situation where we start to thaw the permafrost and then there's nothing we can do to keep it in the ground. The best research says that's probably not the case, or if it is the case, it's quite resilient to, um, to human forcing. But the point I want to make is if we want to stay in a safe and good place for humanity, we need to understand what our direct footprint is and what the ecosystem response is to that. Because if we don't take into account an extra 20% of carbon from the boreal forest and permafrost, then we're going to overshoot that climate target by 20%, which is a big deal. So now, if we integrate law three, that nature knows best, we're positioned to look at all of the environmental issues uh, on Earth. This is an analysis from that same science paper in 2015, where they split up the Earth system into nine dimensions. They said, what are uh, how much land system change can the Earth uh, handle before it transitions into a non-Holocene-like state? So that's gobbledygook, right? What's the Holocene? What came before the uh, Anthropocene? So that's the only time period that we know that human civilization can flourish. It could be that humans could have an alternative uh, configuration of where we live, what we eat, what we do in a different climate and earth situation. But using the precautionary principle, this is the only one that we're sure of. So let's draw lines at the variation that we observed during the Holocene when human civilization developed. Now, again, this is one group's assessment, one of the most prestigious groups, but it's interesting to me what they identified. Um, loss of genetic diversity, they call this dimension uh, biosphere integrity. That's that 1,000-fold increase in the number of species who are going extinct. 
They say with absolute certainty we've gone beyond that threshold. It doesn't mean that it's irreversible, right? If we change what's causing that, we might be able to move back. But if we maintain that, then we're beyond that range that we observed in the Holocene. Now the other place that we're sure we're beyond is biochemical flows. I call this the nutrient overdose. Nitrogen and phosphorus. And it comes from fertilizers that we put on our field, some of them run off, and then the other place is more intimate. Where do these come from? Our excrement. So we eat that food that is being grown with this giant disequilibrium. All of the extra nitrogen we're taking out of the atmosphere, phosphorus we're taking out of the earth. We eat it, we uh, excrete huge amounts of it. So that's what's going into Utah Lake, for example. That accounts for about 80 or 90% of the nutrient load to Utah Lake. And then there are two in the, uh, the yellow zone, land system change and climate change. Uh, so th that usually comes as a surprise to people that I talk with because if you're like me, what you hear speak of most often is just this one dimension, climate change. But I think that this is somewhat reductionist. It's looking at uh, the physical and some biological aspects of the Earth system, but it's not looking at the human side of the Earth system. And that's actually why I would propose four different prioritized environmental issues. The first one is harm to human well-being from environmental pollution which I believe is the most critical crisis that we're facing right now. The second one is the decline of life on Earth. So that's the biosphere integrity. We're losing so many species we don't even know how many. We don't know what their purpose is, what roles they play in the ecosystem. Third, the global nutrient overdose, extra nitrogen, extra phosphorus, and then finally climate change. So I hope to convince you of that over the next few minutes. Um, Here are the deaths caused by pollution every year. These are established. You, uh, it almost never says pollution on a death certificate. So you have to use uh, public health uh, and epidemiological methods to determine this. It's the same way we figured out how many people were dying from tobacco, for example. Um, and the red color is outdoor air pollution, green color indoor air, purple water, blue occupational and orange soil summing up to uh, about 15 million people a year. So let's put it into context. I've listed other sources of death. This is mainly from the World Health Organization and a few other sources. So I'm gonna do a big reveal. Natural disasters, war, murder, so that's all violence except for suicide, and drug use. That's the number of people who are dying each year from those sources. Now I would say that those absolutely are global crises doesn't mean that they're unimportant to see how big that other bar is. But for me, it makes me ask, why aren't we talking about and doing more about that bar? Okay, suicide, malnutrition, road accidents. Also, really big issues. Um, here in Utah, we subsidize the road system to the tune of $650 million a year. That's supposed to be coming from a gas tax. Instead, we take that from a general fund improve the safety and flow of our roads, partly because we're really concerned about um, road accidents. We have those amazing signs that I think are inspiring. Zero deaths, the only acceptable goal. I'd like us to apply that same thinking to an issue that's killing many more people, including here in Utah. And then the reveal for the rest of these, alcohol, tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria, the most deadly communicable diseases, obesity, and tobacco. If you add together all of the dietary risk factors, uh, poor eating, malnutrition, obesity, you get to about 12 million. So that means if we threw away all of our nutrition programs and guidelines and just focused on eliminating pollution, there would be fewer people that die from that solution. And I'm not, I shouldn't have even said that. <laughs> we need to work on all of these things. Uh, but the problem is that we're, there's this huge gap when I talk to people, environmental pollution seems like something that Captain Planet talked about in the 80s and 90s, not something that's in the 2000s. Um, so here's the uh, geographic distribution of that loss of life. So this is another one of the issues. Uh, this is actually outdated now, it's from 2015. The numbers, uh, now that we have better global scale data, are about twice that, that amount. So it's around 100 per 100,000 people in the US. So that's the lowest color. Um, U.S. and some other developed countries goes up to uh, very high levels. I'm going to come back to why this geographic distribution is really important and also problematic from an ethical perspective. 
Okay, so life on Earth, I am hypothesizing or claiming that's the second most important issue. What's going on? One million of the eight to nine million species on Earth are threatened with extinction over the next uh, few decades. That's a big proportion of life on Earth, especially since it's the species that tend to live in closest proximity to humans. So they're ones that are fulfilling really important um, goals. I talked about this before. There's been an 80% decrease in the biomass of wild animals globally. That's ocean and land. Huge number of species driven to extinction every year by humans. And what's surprising about this distinction, and what's very different than previous mass extinctions, is how it's distributed across all of the branches of the tree of life. So these uh, figures up here, the red shows the percentage of species in that group who are um, threatened with imminent extinction. And you'll notice invertebrates, where the majority of the diversity in the animal side of the tree of life lives, are particularly uh, hard hit. So if it's red or orange, uh, that's bad news. Um, now with the first one, human health impacts, uh, I'm very rarely challenged on that one. People might say, your numbers are probably too high. Uh, the medical research says the numbers are almost certainly too low, because it's only including the factors that we really have well constrained. But this one, biodiversity, I often get people who ask, does it really matter? I mean, there are lots of animals on Earth. And so I wanted to make a brief case for why I think it matters. Uh, and this is using the, the lens of ecosystem services, which are the benefits that our society and our species freely receives from nature. We have provisioning services. This is, these are like natural resources. Regulating services, protecting us from floods, from uh, extreme weather events, also removing our waste. Cultural ecosystem services. Many of us have, either as individuals or groups, uh, meaningful relationships that actually, uh, if you're a cold-hearted economist like Costanza, who I'm quoting here, you can put a, a dollar amount on that. How, how willing are you to spend money to travel to Mecca or the Sacred Grove or somewhere else, a, a, an environment that has meaning to you? And then supporting services that allow all of those to exist. Now, if you add these up, again, this is a reductionist view. I'm not claiming that this is the value of nature. This is the benefit to society from nature. It's um, around $145 trillion a year. And the total GDP, again, both I uh, picked a number that was from around the same time of this study, is around $76 trillion a year. That means that even if we dedicated all of the human productivity towards replacing nature, We'd only get halfway there. And again, this is only really a part of nature that we can uh, boil down and, and quantify. So this is provided by that biosphere integrity, by those species. It's not just something pretty to look at, though I think that animals are amazing. Again, I, spent, I wasted my childhood watching National Geographic and nature. Uh, but even in cold, hard dollars and cents, it's a big deal. And when I took my economics class, this is what I was taught about the different types of capital, that you have financial capital, and within that you have natural and human capital. But the ecological economic view completely reverses this, where there are only things that exist in the environment. So human society is completely nested within nature, and I've scaled this um, to represent the overall human footprint, right? So we actually do uh, occupy about three quarters of nature. And then the economy is a subsection of that society. And this was actually uh, reinforced. You can find a Brigham Young quote on almost anything. But I found one that, <laughs> found one that lined up uh, here quite, quite nicely. The riches of the kingdom or nation do not consist so much in the fullness of its treasury as in the fertility of the soil, and the industry of its people. So here also, he's reinforcing that green before orange before gray. There's not an uh, environmental sector of the economy. The economy is a fraction of the environment. For me, that turns the whole question on its head. We're no longer saving the Earth as some kind of service. We're realizing there is no planet B. We're saving the Earth, even if it's just out of totally selfish self-preservation. The other reason uh, was encapsulated really nicely by Aldo Leopold. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So we just don't know how most of these systems work. We haven't described the majority of species on Earth. And again and again and again, we're learning that there are these keystone species. Unlikely 
invertebrate here, a cozy vertebrate, but tiny compared to the other things, that um, holds the whole thing together. We have not been able to reliably predict what species are keystone species. We only find it out when the system collapses. And then we say, oh, that was the piece that was really critical. So we don't know which of these species are keystone. We need, if we want those ecosystem services to continue, to protect as many of them as we can. Okay, on to the third issue, nutrients, this nutrient overdose. You can see this problem from space. This is uh, an algal bloom in the Baltic Sea. So you have Sweden over here, Russia, Lithuania, Latvia. Um, the green coloring is an algal bloom that's caused by agricultural runoff. Um, there's a really intensely uh, farmed area over here. And these, as uh, diets change and population grows, those fluxes are expected to increase. So sorry for the grainy figure. This is the best paper on fluxes of nitrogen and phosphorus from Seitzinger, um, but a low resolution picture. So especially in Southeast Asia, Central America, we're expecting nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes to go up. This already, uh, we've increased the, um, the flux of these elements by two to five fold. And nutrients sound great. I eat gummy vitamins almost every day. I'm supposed to give them to my kids, but they're too tasty. So <laughs> you can have too much of a good thing. We call that uh, condition eutrophication. I think it's Greek as well. Uh, it means well-nourished. And more and more ecosystems have an overabundance of nutrients in them. And that's okay at the beginning. The plants, uh, photosynthesizers rejoice. But then you get hypoxia, so low oxygen, and even anoxia that develops. And most organisms, at least most higher organisms, need oxygen. So if this was the initial state of the ecosystem, if you push the uh, ecosystem into eutrophic state, it may completely collapse, lose most of your biodiversity, and then it could take decades or centuries. There's one example from Switzerland of a lake that underwent eutrophication when the Romans colonized that area. Then their civilization collapsed and they left. You can see from the lake sediment that it wasn't for about 600 years that this medium-sized lake took to, re to recover and go back to a normoxic state. So again, these systems think on different timescales than the four, eight, 20 year timescales that we're used to dealing with. Um, there also are uh, poisonous effects for humans. So there are links between eutrophication and um, Alzheimer's and other neurological diseases. And it also harms the economy because it trashes fisheries. You may have heard of the dead zone at the Gulf of Mexico. There now are dead zones at the mouth of virtually every large river because the human footprint has extended out over the world. Okay, number four, climate change. So destabilization of the climate leads to, I really like this term, um, global weirding. So this is the global average temperature um, which has indisputably increased. Uh, despite what you may have heard, there's no controversy about this issue. Multiple independent uh, methods have confirmed at a global scale, things are getting hotter. We've disrupted the energy budget uh, of the Earth's atmosphere. But that doesn't mean that every place is getting warmer. Right? The Midwest is actually on a, a short-term decrease in temperature because of Arctic air that's getting shunted down. So we've destabilized the climate system, which makes precipitation unreliable. It changes the times that there's enough soil moisture to grow crops. Uh, it causes sea level rise as those different uh, ice caps and uh, things melt, ocean acidification, wildfire, other disturbances. And then it puts pressure on biodiversity and exacerbates human systems. So everything is connected, right? I'm presenting these as four separate uh, issues, but everything is connected. Uh, I was asked a lot this uh, last fall, does, is climate change responsible for the wildfires in Australia? This is straight from the uh, Australian Met Office website, a little um, emoji of Australia for each year from 1910 to the present. And then it's not showing the overall temperature, it's showing the departure from the average temperature. So they have records that go back about 100 years before that. And if it's a tan color, neither warmer nor cooler, warm color or a cool color. And you can see, especially from 2013 on, this extremely strong climate change signature 
that was directly responsible for uh, the wildfires that uh, spread in Australia. Likewise, in the United States, this is the extremely damaging, uh, as far as human life and infrastructure, campfire that happened in 2018. And if you look at all of the changes that we've made in management of these ecosystems and account for them, because we used to suppress more fires than we have now, you can isolate the climate change signature. This is a, um, a recent paper that found that approximately half of all area burned in the West is now directly attributable to human-caused climate change. So again, climate change isn't something in the future. It's something that we're living with. Um, likewise, this is another picture I took out of the side of an airplane, a commercial flight, uh, northern Greenland. And this is the amount of sea level rise from loss of ice in the northern hemisphere. And th this, the biggest uh, one in the room is Greenland. It was pretty flat. So that was where we could have felt pretty good. We're not having an impact on the system. And then all of a sudden, uh, it exploded around the year 2000 and has since been putting out. On this side, it's thousands of gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tons of water or a cubic kilometer of water. Huge amounts of water that we're changing from far away, right? Very few people live in Greenland. But here, when we turn on our cars, when we heat our houses, those greenhouse gases are affecting uh, the Earth system as a whole. So what's causing these four crises? Don't worry, I'm coming to the end. First of all, I want to point out, I actually think that three and four are primarily important because of their links with one and two. And dirty energy is behind many of these problems. So that's using fossil fuel that has not only carbon dioxide particulates it's putting in the atmosphere, it puts nitrogen and phosphorus into the atmosphere that's deposited. Um, also, it's the uh, direct cause of climate change. So about 80% of pollution is caused by dirty energy. Habitat loss is the number one driver for what uh, is going on with loss of biodiversity. Second to that is invasive species. Again, an issue that I don't hear spoken of with the same importance as a lot of other ones. And then here are two human ones, overconsumption and ignorance, denial, and despondency. And I don't, I don't actually use these terms in a pejorative sense. I am ignorant of many things. I'm in denial of many things. It's a description of the current state when you look at what people believe about the um, objective reality. And then you have interactions among these groups here. So I'm going to go really quickly uh, through for dirty energy. 80% of environmental pollution comes from fossil fuel combustion. And if you look at what's driving climate change, it's all greenhouse gases. Now, ozone should also be included as a, as a greenhouse gas, ozone in the troposphere. 